Hello, and welcome again to Basics of the Game. Uh, uh, this is going to be another one of my uh, reviews of the Mistara Gazetteer uh, ones. Uh, this one is uh, uh, so noted as Gaz7, G-A-Z-7, uh, which is uh, the Northern Reaches, which is kind of a, a, an interesting thing. Um, Vikings are are actually really big right now. Uh, there's a lot of uh, biking stuff in popular media right now, uh, ranging from video games to uh, uh, fairly successful uh, History Channel show. Uh, Vikings are a thing right now. Uh, these things come in cycles. It happens. The Northern Reaches is um, the old Mistara settings version of Vikings. I mean, they are un unapologetic of, of the fact that they pretty much lift almost all of the stuff from real Norse culture when they were writing this uh, setting. And they say it up front. They give you some uh, resources to go look up. Uh you know, Norse culture, and uh, if you haven't actually read about Norse culture, it's interesting because people have a lot of assumptions about Norse culture that maybe isn't true. Um, but, uh, you know, Vikings, first off, let's start with the, the basic. Uh, you go a Viking. It's a, an activity. The Vikings were people who went a Viking, which was raiding. And that says a lot about the cultures involved here. <clears throat> the there are men of the, and women of the north, and uh, they live in a harsh land and raid along the sea coast, uh, and that's considered perfectly respectable in their sort of framework of culture. And the Northern Reaches keeps to that. Um, Northern Reaches actually breaks it up into uh, uh, three basic uh, nations. Uh, in uh, There's Ostland, which is very much still part of the, yeah, we raid up and down the coast. We respect strength. Uh, and violence, uh, at, you know, classic what you would picture as Viking culture. Then there's Vestland, which sort of represents the transition from that in some regards. It's a, it's a much more modern nation with trade and buildings made of ma mainly stone instead of sod and wood. Um, they, you know, they have a large merchant class and things like that. And then there's the Sodafjord Yardlums. Now the Sodafjord Yardlums is sort of in between there. They are still somewhat like the Osland, but there's a strong element that kind of wants to be more like Vestland. And they sort of go in between there. Now, uh, this book like the other gazetteers, has some back and forth of oddness, I guess. Because they hadn't, I guess, because they hadn't figured out how to do these things, this, yet again, does some different things than the previous gazetteers. It does some of the same things, too, but it, it introduces some new things, and it seems very haphazard in how it presents some of them. That said, I, I liked it. I think it was well done. I think that uh, the uh, overall cultures involved uh, are interesting. Um, th they did keep fairly close to more historical Vikings, and they used the three nations to represent the the sort of different ages of Norse cultures, I guess. Uh, they have uh, some excellent suggestions for books 
on Vikings. I've looked up some of these, uh, and actually, that you know, uh, they've got some good, good resources that they've got listed here. Uh, and they uh, list a couple of adventures that you might want to check out because they did that in a lot of these. Uh, and I find it interesting to look at this because I could come up with some suggestions of books to read now that hadn't been written when this was created. Um, so, that, you know, that's a, an interesting thing. Uh, they also, as part of the book, they, they, they sort of give you a, an idea of, of they're going to have these commentary characters, and they give you a write-up early on on who the commentary characters are. So when you're reading a part in quotes, it's from one of these characters, uh, which I thought was a nice touch, um, but it doesn't really consistently mark who's talking when. So that's sometimes annoying, uh, but it's still, it's neat. Um, it also gives an alternate view on a dwarven culture that is related to, but not the same of, uh, uh, as the dwarves um, from, of Rockholm. So it, it's a little interesting in that regard. There's some other uh, races uh, involved here, the gnomes have a particular history in this section of the world, and it's not a good one. Uh, they had a kingdom that was really successful and really legendary, and then it was overrun and everybody was killed. Pretty much. Uh, which is not cool. Uh, they talk about the other non-human uh, races in this section. Uh, for instance, they, they talk a lot about the, uh, uh, the trolls and gnolls and giants that live in the area and their influence on the culture. Uh, and, you know, it's, they, they do the standard breakdown. They break down the, uh, the, the, the geography of the area. Think uh, Norway, Scandinavia, and you would have kind of a picture of what they were going for here. There's some island island parts. There are some coastline parts. There's some swampy lands and cold uh, regions. There's some mountains. It's really kind of like that. Um, they give some guidance on doing politics in uh, these three nations, which is interesting because when people think of Vikings, they don't often think of the politics involved. But as some of the recent media examples can show, you could have some really interesting politics in it, even in those co uh, those contexts. Uh, even with the occasional, you know, you know what? I can just kill you. <laughs> uh, nature of that uh, uh, culture. Politics is still important. They break down the various nations, like you do. Um, and they also talk about their priesthood. This is another one that's interesting because they, in the early books, they talk about churches that sort of generically revere immortals, right? Uh, and then the Emirates of Yerlarm has a religion that is the one true religion, but they acknowledge it was founded by a guy who revered the immortals. Immortals. He lists a couple of them that he met, but he, they revere the immortals. And leave it at that. Uh, not so with this one. This one, they pretty much stick to the classic Norse gods, Odin, Thor, you know, all of that is here. And so, you know, it, it takes some uh, getting used to uh, it, in that it's a transition. Uh, and they they don't make any bones about the fact that, that yes, we lifted this completely from Norse, uh, you know, mythology. Uh, they don't really change much. Uh, and uh, the, the clerics here, while they call them immortals throughout, they are worshipping 
the gods of the Norse gods. A uh, few things that are different here than some of the other settings that you might be f familiar with. Uh, some of the names are different. Uh, for instance, uh, a Jarl is, uh, is basically the aristocracy, the nobility. And a Jarldom is the lands that are held by that particular uh, noble. A Jarl is a noble. Uh, another one that a uh, term that you have to get used to that is different uh, is a thrall. Uh, thralls are slaves. Pure and simple, they're slaves. Uh, and one of the cultures acts absolutely uh, goes, yes, we take thralls. And then there's others that sort of kind of look down on it, but maybe look the other way sometimes too. Um, and then there are freemen who are just like free people who are not thralls and, and they're not jarls. They're somewhere in between. Now, um, the, the politics between the, the various nations is interesting. Osland is the island nations. So it's very, uh, very much in near the, the coastline of the other two nations there. And it's a very big raiding, and we're strong, and we will come and take your stuff culture. So there's a constant source of tension there. They th think it's perfectly fine. It's not a declaration of war to just send a raiding party out. That's just what you do. And the other nations are, you know, coming from a similar cultural background. So they don't immediately treat it like an act of war, but they are less and less okay with being raided. Um, so it, it's it's interesting in that regard. Let's see other things that are worth noting here. Uh, they give a again a very detailed breakdown on the the different towns, regions, um, some of the current events, uh, the 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 uh, the, the various threats in the region, uh, the interactions with some of the other non-human races, um, and, you know, just in general, trying to uh, give a, a, a detailed look at what this particular section of the world looks like. Uh, they, uh, they do have their own version of dwarves, uh, in that uh, they're, I guess, banished is the best way to... They're not very clear on what exactly happened, but that they uh, pursued some unfortunate choices in their research, and they were cast out of the rest of Dwarven culture. Uh, and they're called Modrigsworg. Modrigsworg. Um, and they make magical weapons, like, insanely. They are really good at it. Uh, they have actually, uh, made, like, some of the ma magical weapons of the, the, the immortals. So, uh, they made the sphere for Od uh, Odin, and, uh, they, they, you know, made enchanted ships, and, uh, Thor's hammer and all that. These are the guys. These are the guys who made them. Uh, so they're masters of making stuff. Uh, they are also very archaic in their way of talking and way of dealing with people. Uh, and uh, they don't uh, they don't like to uh, deal with the outside world too much. So that's part of their uh, cultural identity, I guess. Uh, they're also referred to as uh, rot drawers, so that's charming. Um, they actually give you the DM uh, advice of if you have one of these uh, being, you know, talking to the PCs, that you should take on a more Shakespearean tone of speech to represent how odd they are uh, to talk to. So that, that gives you an idea of the kind of guidance that they give there. Now, 
Uh, beyond those, uh, they do talk about the trolls and some of the other, the Knoll tribes. Uh, they lay out several adventures in here, which I find interesting. Uh, the adventures are fairly... How to put this? Um, they're not uh, as fully formed as a full form module, but they are pretty well uh, detailed. They give lots of advice, uh, different things to do as a uh, a way of uh, you know dealing with PCs doing different things. There's a murder mystery adventure in there, and they give GM advice on how to handle murder mysteries in a magical and fantasy culture and you know what tactics you can take to sort of head off some of the more weird things that you can do in that um they give some rough rules about kobolds as a race so that's cool they uh, uh have a few adventures in there actually that are pretty good, actually, including some that involve a murder mystery and uh, uh, the politics in Newt's court and some of the other places. So it's 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 definitely got some good b breakdown stuff of, here's how you would set this campaign up here. Uh, beyond the rest of those adventures, they also give some actual ca um, campaign advice as far as establishing PC... Uh, cultures that are there. They also include a couple of other interesting wrinkles, I guess. Uh, they add rune magic, which uh, I would not have maybe done that, honestly. Maybe add a few spells to the cleric list and call it a day. No, you can actually get magical runes from the immortals and then they give you uh, a, a, a caution on letting PC, uh, PCs uh, abuse this and how to prevent them from abusing this. Uh, they also have uh, some advice on uh, preventing abuse on the skill system, uh, which, hmm, it seems a bit scattered to put that in separate little uh, gazetteers, but this was an evolving product line, and, you know, maybe they hadn't worked out all those the tricks that we might have done now. You know, these days, you wanted to add some alternate rules, that's cool, but you wouldn't put, like, well, here's part of the skill system in this setting book, and there's the other thing that you need to know about skill systems over here. Uh, the, so that's... Uh, in, in another product altogether. But again, that's sort of a product of this is relatively new stuff for them at this point. And, um, you know, we figured out different ways of doing it now. They break down the other worlds uh, in the Norse pantheon. Uh, so uh, Asgard, Vanaheim, Muspelheim, uh, Midgard being the world that everybody lives in, uh, the uh, Yggdrasil, the World Tree, Alfheim, Niflheim, Svartalheim, uh, yeah, the, the 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 different realms of the uh, uh, Asgard pantheon and how they view the worlds and where these different people are from and so on. It's you know, it's a good primer. I recommend you actually read a mythology book to actually get an idea of what they're talking about there. But that's cool. Uh, they do add a section on adapting gazetteers to advance Dungeons & Dragons campaigns, which is interesting. They talk about some of the challenges involved, uh, some of the ways to make them more uh, usable in some of the different sections. Um you know, they, they they talk about maybe adding a gazetteer to the Forgotten Realms and where it might fit, uh, some of the rules challenges, things like that. Uh, but it, it, 
it, it's interesting that they added that in there. They then get to a PC section, which uh, is, you know, all the, the things that people just know about these cultures that are just well known to the people living there and outsiders, what have you. Uh, social status, names, all the PC knowledge as opposed to Game Master knowledge about what it would be like to live there. Now, they do add <laughs> another odd system in this particular thing as an optional system that they didn't have in any of the previous ones, and I'm willing to bet this optional system doesn't make an end to any of the later ones. Uh, personality traits, which have ratings on them, and you can roll against those ratings to see what you do. It's kind of like a humanity trait from uh, World of Darkness, I guess. Uh, and your relative level in these traits represents, you know, different ends of a scale. So the trait for cautious, uh, it, you know, if you didn't have a lot of uh, points in it, might mean that you are rash or something like that. Uh, if modest, be proud, and so on. Uh, the further the points are, uh, represent how strongly you are influenced by that trait. They also include, uh, you know, modifiers for different races and different cultures and how you would use those uh, for the uh, these traits and how the alignments affect these traits. I, while I applaud them trying something new, really this is probably the most confusing addition of any of the rules that they've added to any of the gazetteers. And... It did need to exist. I, I don't. I, I guess it's nice that they were experimenting. I guess, but it really didn't need to exist. Um, they have also you know, rules for being a part of a clan. You know what your obligations are, what you get for being a part of a clan, having your own dominion, owning a, a, a stronghold and a, a, a small, you know, bit, bit of. Uh, Landed gentry is kind of a common theme in early D&D, and they have some rules concerning it. They also include rules for uh, skill usage, like actually a good portion of the other gazetteers included this as well, and how you would get bonus skills and so on. Uh, and they add uh, backgrounds. So, again, this is sort of an odd addition, but prescient, where you can have, uh, you roll and you get like a background. So you might end up with Sailor. And then you get like these, you can pick a, a couple of skills from a list that you automatically have is because of that background. <laughs> you know, 5th edition's got backgrounds in it now. So, I mean, that's definitely a, a, a thing. But it... Uh, it was relatively unheard of in this particular version of D&D. Uh, and introducing it halfway through all the gazetteers is problematic. This probably should have been in one of the box sets and just called it a, you know, part of the game. But, whatever. Um, uh, the background table here is in, is very much tied to the cultures involved here. Like for playing a cleric, uh, one of the uh, the background basically chooses what kind of priest you are. And this determines what skill extras you get and things like that. So it's uh, it, that's an interesting aspect to it. It's got some uh, breakdowns on what the skills mean and how they work. They also include uh, as part of your past experiences, uh, you can actually have had things like diseases in the past that leave their mark on you. And you can get uh, other past experiences 
that uh, give you cool gifts or give you bonuses in different uh, charisma modifiers and <sighs> it's weird honestly this is a little too uh, convoluted for this for the uh, sort of where D&D was at this point I think that uh, I remember picking up the old casting call books and they were pretty much all that. You roll on a table and you build up a background and it gave you certain bonuses and sub, uh, minuses and so on for having that background. This is actually in a D&D &D product at a time when they didn't actually have this before talking about the uh, past experiences and how they influence your character. And, you know, it's a randomized thing so you could end up with, like, I had gut worms. And I have a 10% chance of negative 1 on Constitution. Or I hit Brain Rot. Minus 1 to all abilities. No annual training, character building, or combat experience. Yeah. Some of these were pretty terrible. I don't really know why this is in here. Um, but they're here. They give some... Uh, you know, how to handle naming, uh, how to uh, run your cleric in the realm, and what the different gods, uh, sorry, immortals, mean to these uh, clerics. Some new spells, which is nice. Uh, some uh, spells related to runes, like uh, interpreting runes, know the runes, inscribe runes, uh, bless runes, things like that that help sort of activate existing uh, mystical runes. And they also uh, give you some actual runes and what they mean. Um, and how they might be used. Uh, so, but that particular section is not fully formed. It gives a list of them and what the, the those... Uh, runes would be used for, but it doesn't really give you a lot of guidance on how it fits into the world. Um, so, I don't know. Anyways, that's my breakdown of the Northern Reaches Gazetteer. Uh, ultimately, I liked it. One thing about the actual book itself, it comes with a 3D like punch out little cardboard things that you uh, would assemble and, you know, you'd have a, a Viking village. And, you know, you it gives a lot of details about running a military campaign in this particular section of the world, and you would have to defend the village and things like that. It's, it's good. Uh, it, it's a good book, but it, it is super, super convoluted, I guess is the thing I would say. It's, it's random uh, at parts. The parts that they get right, they get really, really right. And then they start tossing in some bits that aren't fully thought out, and they don't really feel like they belong there yet. They weren't fully cooked. So, I, you know, I, while I like the cultural and write-up and the adventure and campaign guidance here, I didn't like the player options as they presented them in this book. Um, so I would generally ignore those. But, uh, you know, it's worth checking out, certainly. Uh, especially if you're going to be running any kind of Viking-inspired game. There's a lot of good advice here. There's a lot of good breakdowns of, you know, how court politics works in a Viking court. And, uh, you know, what, the, what raiding cultures are like. So if you're looking at doing something like that, this is actually not a bad resource. Anyways, that's my thoughts. Uh, I have rambled way too long on this particular one. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up. I hope you liked it, and I will be doing another one of these coming soon. Um, thanks for watching. Uh, subscribe, like, 
share with all the people, and uh, be sure to check out some of my other videos, my rambles, my geek word. Uh, I have them all in, in playlists, so it should be easy to find. Thanks, and have a nice night.